Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. My quest to review every Razzie Worst Picture winner brings me to 2004, and one of the first movies I ever reviewed on this show. Ah, my webcam days. I do not miss them, nor did I particularly miss this movie. It's time to take a second look at Catwoman. Spoiler alert, it still sucks. But before we get into that, we're going to back up a bit to 1992. That was the year theatergoers were graced with Batman Returns, the sequel to Tim Burton's Batman once again starring Michael Keaton in the title role. While he faced off with Jack Nicholson's Joker in the first movie, this time the caped crusader would have to contend with two supervillains, the wretched Oswald Cobblepot, aka the Penguin, played by Danny DeVito, and femme fatale Selina Kyle, aka Catwoman, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. It wasn't the first time Catwoman had graced the big screen as she was previously portrayed by Lee Merriweather in Batman the Movie, which was based on the 1966 TV series and hit theaters shortly after the first season aired. But of course, what Tim Burton had in mind for the character was considerably darker than the campy 1960s TV show. Before becoming everyone's favorite cat burglar, she was Selina Kyle, the timid secretary of corrupt businessman Max Schreck. After spotting Max's super secret corrupt business plans, she's killed by defenestration but is then resurrected by cats. It happens. And after a change in wardrobe, she becomes the Catwoman. Sexy, yet scary. Playful, yet dangerous. Clever, yet psychotic. And Pfeiffer was amazing in this role. I can't imagine anyone doing a better job bringing this character to life. Sorry, Sean Young. Due to the overwhelmingly positive reception for the character, a Catwoman spin-off movie was planned with Burton returning to direct and Pfeiffer reprising her role. Unfortunately, the project languished in development hell for many years. Burton and Pfeiffer both eventually moved on to other things. Ashley Judd was supposed to take over the role at some point, but eventually she dropped out as well. And ultimately, what we got was the 2004 movie starring Halle Berry and directed by Jean-Christophe Comas, known by the pseudonym Pitoff. And to this day, I have not been able to find a definitive answer as to what that pseudonym actually means. He's a Frenchman, but I don't think Pitoff is a French word. Google Translate tells me it's the Greek word for pie, but that just leaves me with more questions. Anyway, Pitoff has primarily worked in visual effects during his career and only ever directed three movies. The first was Vidocq, a French sci-fi film loosely based on a famous criminalist starring Gerard Depardieu. The second was Catwoman, the first and last Hollywood film he directed. Poor bastard never had a chance. And the third was a Romanian-produced sci-fi channel movie called Fire and Ice, which despite the title has nothing to do with Game of Thrones, although it does feature dragons. And John Reese davies so it's probably not all bad. And that was the brief directorial career of Pitoff. In my original review, I referred to him as a combination of pretentious and incompetent, and I feel that I should walk that back. Calling him pretentious purely because he had a pseudonym I didn't understand was immature on my part, and I apologize for that. I should be better. But he's still a terrible director, I stand by that. Anyway, the Catwoman movie we eventually got over a decade after Batman Returns has dick all to do with the DC Comics character, apart from the name and the costume? To an extent? But I don't think I have ever seen a Catwoman costume this shitty. It starts out as a basic leather outfit with boob zippers. How did I not notice the boob zippers the first time around? Why does it have boob zippers? Why would anything have boob zippers? And then it eventually morphs into this. Shitty torn pants, open-toed high heels, perfect footwear for combat, and bootleg Mickey Mouse ears. The person who designed that hot mess of an outfit was Oscar-winning costume designer Angus Strathy. The Oscar was not for this movie. What's even more hilarious is there's a scene where she actually wears this costume to a nightclub, and for the life of me, I cannot fathom how she even got past the bouncer with huge, sharp claws on her gloves and a bullwhip. I sometimes get stopped by security if I forget to take my mini Swiss Army knife off my keychain. Who the hell let her in the door? Anyway, the woman behind the very silly mask is not Selina Kyle, or indeed anyone else who assumed the Catwoman name in the comics, but a new character named Patience Phillips who lives and works in... a city. Is it Gotham? Is it New York? Is it Vancouver? I mean, it is actually Vancouver, but is it supposed to be Vancouver in the movie? Who knows? And there's not a single character from the comics in sight. No Batman, no Jim Gordon, no Joker, no Penguin, not even the Condiment King. 
You might be wondering, why does the Catwoman movie have so little to do with Catwoman? Well, according to John Rogers, one of the movie's writers who was ultimately fired but lasted long enough to be credited, there was some weird rights issue that basically allowed them to use the Catwoman name but little else. One wonders why they bothered. I also find it hilarious that Rogers got fired from the movie because he kept trying to make it not suck. But clearly that was not the kind of movie the studio wanted to make. Granted, it's not super surprising that someone would try to make a comic book movie that had little to do with the source material. Nowadays, the MCU will take almost anything in their catalog and throw it at the big screen, no matter how silly it might seem on paper, and audiences eat that shit up. Hell, they made two movies featuring the best friend pairing of a talking raccoon and tree, and they made over one and a half billion dollars combined. But the early aughts were a very different time. Lots of people back then wanted to make superhero movies, but they seemed to be deathly afraid of the movies actually resembling the tone or style of the comics they were based on. Sometimes this worked, like the X-Men movies. Sometimes it didn't work, like the X-Men movies. On the other hand, every once in a while you'd get a comic book movie that wasn't afraid to be a comic book movie. And sometimes this worked as well, like the Spider-Man movies. And sometimes, well, you know where I'm going with this joke. But Catwoman took things in a more extreme direction by not only not looking like a comic book movie, but not taking anything from the source material apart from the name, leading many to dub this movie Sino, Catwoman in name only. And for this review, I shall do likewise. So if you haven't seen Sino or my original review, or someone else's review, I'm sure there's a ton of them out there, Patience Phillips is an extremely timid woman and a total klutz, although her klutziness is not very consistent. Early on, she seems to struggle to walk without tripping or running into someone, but when she sees a cat outside her apartment window and tries to climb out to save it, which is stupid, it's a cat, it's fine, she is suddenly incredibly sure-footed. The only reason she nearly falls and has to be rescued by Officer Tom, played by Benjamin Bratt, is the AC unit she's standing on buckles. A little consistency, please? Anyway, Patience works for a cosmetics company, along with her best friend, played by Alex Borstein, whose personality can best be summed up as... horny. And her sassy gay friend, who only has, like, two lines. And boy, does that feel like a waste. If you're going to give your hero a sassy gay friend, at least have the decency to put him in more than one scene. Otherwise, what's the point? You can't half-ass the trope, you gotta go all the way. Justice for the sassy gay friend. Anyway, this company is run by the husband and wife team of Lambert Wilson and Sharon Stone. They've just introduced a new line of skin cream called Buline. Somebody was paid to come up with that name. I'm guessing it wasn't John Rogers. Things go from bad to worse for patients as she inadvertently overhears the head of Buleen R&D explaining that it has potentially devastating side effects. And my god, this scene is ridiculous for a variety of reasons. First of all, this line. The headaches and the, the, the nausea and the, the fainting spells, those are symptoms I can live with. Headaches, nausea, and fainting spells are symptoms you can live with? This ain't the cure for cancer, jackass. It's a friggin' skin cream. It's not supposed to give you fainting spells. Second, the editing. What is up with the rapid cuts while this guy is just standing there talking? It's not uncommon for directors nowadays to use quick cuts under the pretense of making an action sequence appear more frantic. Though often the real reason is they're trying to hide the fact that the people in the fight scene don't actually know how to fight. But this isn't an action sequence. The guy is just standing there talking. Why the quick cuts? And it's not just this scene, the editing throughout the movie is ass. I mean, look at this scene where Patience and Officer Tom play a little one-on-one. -on -one. I remember this moment being ridiculous, but I had forgotten just how poorly put together it was. It's not a good sign when a scene of two people shooting hoops reminds me of Getaway. But anyway, the third weird thing with this scene is the display behind the scientist that he's using to show Sharon Stone how the skin cream fucks up your skin, which I'm pretty sure is the exact opposite of what a skin cream is supposed to do. You'd think he'd just show some photos of the people from their trials. Oh no. He apparently commissioned the company to build him a series of 3D computer-generated models just so he could show them their product sucks. Also, the eyes move and blink. That's creepy. This is why I wasn't too surprised to find out Pitoff was a visual effects guy by trade. Sino has several shots that seemingly include visual effects just for the sake of it. Like this bit where a camera flies into a CGI building and somehow ends up in front of a house. One of the more ridiculous transitions I've ever seen. 
did we just enter a portal to a parallel universe? What happened here? Anyway, because Patience now knows the company's dirty little secret, they decide she must die. But then, for some reason, a bunch of cats bring her back to life in a scene that resembles Michelle Pfeiffer's resurrection in Batman Returns, except stupid. And as soon as she comes back to life, the madness begins. Her eyes develop a zoom feature. She eats nothing but fish. By hand. She walks around and sleeps on the furniture. She can leap tall buildings in a single bound. She can punch windows. Wait, is that something cats do? And with her newfound cat power, she decides the first thing to do is rob a jewelry store, which is already being robbed by someone else, thus leading to the first of several terrible fight scenes. This movie is largely why I was not prepared for John Wick 3 to feature Halle Berry action star. Because they tried that once, and it did not work. I think we can now safely say it was not Halle's fault. The really weird thing about this scene is Patience swipes a mask to hide her identity, but before she leaves, with the stolen jewels, she puts the mask back. Why? You're already taking the jewels, why would you not keep the mask? Patience eventually tracks down the owner of the cat who brought her back to life, and it turns out she is an actual crazy cat lady who tells Patience she comes from a long line of cat women. Patience is naturally dubious, of course, but the crazy cat lady convinces her by tossing her some catnip, which Patience proceeds to rub all over her face. I suppose this would make Patience a literal crazy cat lady. Also, how did anyone involved with the making of this film not look at the scene with her rubbing the catnip all over her face and not realize they had made a terrible mistake? Eventually, Sino starts investigating Buleen when her friend becomes sick after using it, and she gets framed for the murder of the scientist who wanted to stop it from going to market, and Lambert Wilson. His wife actually wants the skin cream to go to market because apparently, it won't destroy your skin as long as you keep using it, so people will be forced to keep buying it over and over. However, the other side effect of Buleen is it makes you horribly ill. They're not gonna keep buying your product if you kill them off, Sharon. I see a flaw in your plan here. There's also a bit of a plot hole here as Sharon tells Sino that she killed her husband so he would not stop the sale of Buleen. But the movie never actually establishes that he would have done so. In fact, all indications are that he's every bit as scummy as his wife, if not more so. Not only is he a ruthless, foul-tempered, stupid, rich CEO, but he's cheating on his wife with the company's new model who is young enough to be his daughter. Ew. It doesn't seem to me like he'd have any qualms about poisoning the public as long as he could make money off of it. If she killed him solely because he was unfaithful, fine, that I understand. But that's not how the movie makes it look. It just raises too many questions. Anyway, this leads to Patience getting arrested while dressed up like the bride from Kill Bill for some reason, and then she escapes from prison because the bars are made of rubber and she can apparently walk through walls now? I mean, I'm not sure how else this shot is supposed to work. There's literally no other way she can get around that corner unseen. And then we get our final confrontation with Sharon Stone, who reveals she's been using so much Buleen that it has turned her skin into solid marble and she's basically invincible. But considering the other side effects of Buleen, shouldn't she pretty much have keeled over dead by now? At the very least, she should not be healthy enough to fight. Oh, speaking of which, they fight. It's bad. It's really, really bad. It's dimly lit, and again, the editing is ass, which often makes it hard to follow. And, as John Rogers pointed out to the powers that be behind this movie, you do realize the big third act fight in your summer tentpole is Halle Berry dressed like a Quebecois stripper, beating the shit out of a makeup exec in a pantsuit. Well, sure, when you put it that way. But the problem goes beyond stripper versus pantsuit. The big issue here is this fight really has no stakes. Sharon isn't trying to take over the world here, she's just trying to sell a shitty line of skin cream. And even if she does somehow get it to market, it won't be long before either everyone figures out it's toxic and the FDA brings the hammer down, or her own frequent usage of Buleen eventually kills her. Even if she wins this fight, it's a temporary victory at best. But that doesn't happen because Patience ends up knocking her out a window, and she dies. And then there's this line, which I already called attention to in my original review, but I have to point it out again because it's so dumb. I might not be a hero, but I'm certainly not a killer. You just killed someone. Like just now, literally seconds ago, you threw her out a goddamn window and she fell to her death. Now, maybe you did not 
intend to throw her out the goddamn window, but the thing is, and I can't believe I have to spell this out, if you do something by accident, you still did it! You know, it's kind of funny to think what could have been. What would have happened if we actually got that Michelle Pfeiffer standalone Catwoman movie back in the 90s? Would it have been good? I don't know, but I can't imagine it being worse than this. This was a travesty. Almost everything about this movie was wrong. The acting, the directing, the editing, the dialogue, the complete lack of any connection to the comics apart from the name, the costume, oh Jesus Christ, it's all wrong. But as I've said before, the early aughts were a very different time for superhero movies, and audience tastes have changed quite a bit over the years. So would they be more receptive to this movie if it were released today? I don't think so, for a few reasons. One, it's so dumb. Two, there really aren't high enough stakes for a superhero movie. And three, it's really badly made. You have to give your audience some reason to want to plunk down their hard-earned cash, and this has nothing. The movie bombed at the box office and was savaged by critics, and it took home four Razzies. Worst screenplay, worst director, worst actress for Halle Berry, and worst picture. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, this led to one of the more infamous moments in Razzie history when Halle Berry showed up to accept her award in person and gave an amazing acceptance speech. First of all, I want to thank Warner Brothers. <laughs> thank you for putting me in a piece of shit god awful movie. It was just what my career needed, you know? If you haven't seen that speech in its entirety, you should. It's on YouTube and it's wonderful. What is not wonderful is this movie, but at the time this review was published, it is streaming for free on Peacock, and it might be worth a watch if you want to laugh at some inept filmmaking and ridiculous dialogue. You like bad girls? I know I pointed this out before, but they put that line in the trailer. They really had no idea, did they? But of course, the million dollar question. Was it really the worst movie of 2004? Well, I do think it's the worst movie I saw from that year, and I have seen some stinkers from 2004. Some of which I've previously talked about on this show, like Christmas with the Cranks, Home on the Range, and Sino's fellow Worst Picture nominee, Surviving Christmas. I've also seen two of the other nominees, White Chicks, which was painfully unfunny, and Alexander, which certainly was a movie. A very, very, very long movie. There is one nominee I have not seen, Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2, because it's not streaming anywhere, and contrary to what I previously thought, it turns out there are limits on what I will buy. But I don't think I need to see it, because based on what I've heard, if you've seen one Baby Geniuses movie, and I have, you've seen them all. So I guess that means the Razzies get a pass for this year, right? Ho ho ho, if only. I agree with their worst picture choice, but they made some questionable decisions in other categories. They gave worst actor to George W. Bush, worst supporting actor to Donald Rumsfeld, and worst supporting actress to Britney Spears, with Condoleezza Rice receiving a nomination in the same category. All of these people were nominated for Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11, which is a documentary. And none of these people were acting. Really? Now, the Razzies made it quite clear that they were not actually trying to trash Fahrenheit 9-11, which was a critical and commercial success. It won the friggin' Palm Door. No, they were simply using the Razzies to take some pot shots at the Bush administration. And, you know, I get it. W and his cronies can go f*** themselves, but there's two problems. One, Britney Spears wasn't part of the Bush administration, and she's only in the movie for about 15 seconds. That's just petty bullshit. And two, the Golden Raspberry Awards are supposed to be about poking fun at bad movies. If you're hijacking your own awards to make them about something completely unrelated, do the awards even mean anything anymore? Did they ever mean anything at all? So in conclusion, Sino sucks, the Razzies suck, and W sucks. You know who else sucks? Jenny McCarthy. Next time.
Cat got your tongue. 